But that simply means that we have to be at the cutting edge of changes and what is happening in our society. We cannot sweep things under the carpet and pretend they don't exist. We, we need to deal with, with issues. And that's the reason why we believe that God has raised us up here in the city of Port Elizabeth in our country, South Africa, for that express purpose. And that is to present an objective view on issues that possibly have become a bit muddy because of those who oppose and those who stand for a particular viewpoint or stance. We certainly do not want to be arrogant because we believe that arrogance is certainly not the spirit of Christ and the spirit of Christianity. But on the other hand, we want to be assertive. We want to assert sincerely our convictions that what we believe is true. And therefore, as we share with you a few thoughts this evening, we trust that you'll find it most enlightening, and that you will certainly not tar us with the same brush as many people who subscribe to an extreme ultra-fundamentalist view of this particular subject. The first part is dealing with gay, is it okay? And this first of our six-part series will introduce us to many other issues that are relevant to change in our modern society. We also want you to know that we do not support or stand or align ourselves with any right-wing approach to this particular issue because there's a great divide. A divide for those who are for and those who are against. And unfortunately, we are shouting at each other. And as you shout at each other, you find that in any conversation and in any debate, if you shout, your hearer will not hear you. And therefore this evening, we don't want to shout at anyone. We don't want to arrogantly come across as if we have all the answers and that you have no opinion. Everyone is entitled to their opinion. But tonight, we trust that you will hear us out, that you will consider what we have to say in the light of the Christian position and the sacred view of the sacred scriptures. We do understand that many Christians have actually used uh, willy nilly some of the, uh, the passages of scripture and thrown it around to condemn those who they oppose. And the counter argument has been many of those have tried to reinterpret those very same passages. So we are faced with a conundrum in, in the world today where there's a tremendous amount of confusion in this regard. I have invited two young men who are ministers here at St. Mark's to join me, and this is going to be a discussion that the, the three of us will actually have, and we're going to be dealing with some pertinent issues. So I ask you please to put your hands together for Reverend Kenneth and Reverend Warren. Thank you. I'd like to make an opening statement beside before these two young men actually make an opening statement and we get into our subject tonight. We're going to be dealing with three areas. The, the discussion is going to be broken up into three areas. First of all, we're going to deal with the gay controversy. And then secondly, we're going to deal with the gay condition. And then thirdly, we're going to deal with the gay in context, contextualizing the gay movement itself. And in light of this, I'm going to ask Warren to give us an opening statement. Thank you, Warren. Thank you, Bruce. Yes. I think, as you've mentioned, this is a rather controversial subject, but the scriptures are there to correct us, and where there is correction, there will always be controversy. This is a topic that affects all of us. I don't think there's a single person sitting here in the audience or on the platform that doesn't have a family member, somebody that is closely linked to them, that is affected by this topic. And so we have to you know, be sensitive towards it, but we also need to find clarity in what the scriptures say. And in speaking out against this topic, we know that there are many other topics that the scriptures also correct. So that this might be the first of the topics that we're dealing with, but there are many other aspects that we as Christians need to take into account. And we need to always hold the scriptures as our final authority. Because as soon as that is moved out of the way, then it's open to chaos, and our lives will be filled with chaos. Important also just to mention right at the outset that we understand as a church, and as, as, as individuals, that God loves every single human being. Amen. But He hates the sin. And He has done something about it, so that He can demonstrate His love to us, and that He can help us deal with sin. And I think that is our motive for this evening, because we would only want people to 
be in a relationship with the Lord that allows them to grow and to become the people that God would want. Thank you, Warren. If that's your opening statement, we can't be a long way for uh, a lot more that you're going to say on the subject. Uh, Ken, would you like to give us an opening statement? Thank you. Thank you, Bruce. I think it's important for us as Eni to consider what God's Word has to say. But we don't want to condemn any single person. We are not the judge. We're just sharing what God's Word has to say. And I think it's important for us to know that the Christian message is inclusive for everyone who comes and accepts the merits of the Lord Jesus Christ. Any single person who accepts who the Lord Jesus Christ is and what He accomplished on the cross will be a Christian and will be accepted by God. And it's very, very important for us to know that, but have the right attitude toward God's Word. When the attitude is wrong toward God's Word, then we have to really look deep inside. And that's why this evening, as we share God's Word, we all have to consider our own hearts and our attitude towards God's Word. Yes, and of course, over the last couple of decades, we've had an unprecedented attack on the authority of the Bible. Because there's so many different versions, and some people blame Constantine for all of these changes in the Bible, and his attack and persecution of the Gnostics. Uh, and we have the Judas Gospel, we have Down Brown's Great Classic, um, that many people have actually used as an authority to determine what is right or wrong. And uh, that's another subject, and that is the authority of the Bible, and how, how relevant the Bible is, and how the Bible was so called put together, and if it is the Word of God or not, it was written by some uh, maniac. Uh, those are other issues that possibly we will leave for another time. But we certainly will be dealing with uh, the following facts, that among the gay people that I know and are my friends, I have found them to be the most caring, the most kind, the most thoughtful, and the most decent people in many ways than what you would find even in the heterosexual community. And in saying that, we are not condoning the gay movement, but neither are we condemning the gay movement. The position that we do subscribe to is that God has a prototype. And God's prototype, all of us have broken the prototype. Uh, it is wrong for the Christian church to say that the gay movement um, is of the devil and that the gay movement is, has gone against God's order. And just single out and categorize that group or that community, in, in, in the words of Survivor, that tribe. And the Christians become their own tribe, and these two tribes are fighting against each other. And the one is trying to be dominant, the one is trying to actually uh, present herself in such a way that we are normal, we are human beings, we love people, and we care, and, and we, we are more decent than and heterosexuals. And then the heterosexuals that are totally opposed to to uh, um, homosexuality comes out with their particular little theory. So the, the, the point is that tonight, as we take a balanced view on this particular subject, we need to underline the fact that we are born neither heterosexual or homosexual. We are born neither heterosexual or homosexual. Sexual behavior is a learned behavior. It is not a behavior that we are born with. And in our talk this evening, that is going to unfold itself. And as it does, I hope that you will understand that we believe that what we are saying, we say in love and with a tremendous amount of compassion. In saying that this evening, let us define homophobia. What is the definition of homophobia? We're going to project that on the screen, hopefully. The definition of homophobia is a hatred and a fear of homosexuals. Well, if there are some Christians who are homophobic, we would like to put up our hands and say, we are not homophobic. We do not hate, neither are we afraid of homosexuals. Furthermore, I think that homophobic is not the word that we would want to embrace but rather what we would like to be labelled as is homophiliac. You may say that's just a play on semantics. I didn't say hemophiliac, I said homophiliac. 
and therefore a homophobic or a homophiliac, there's a difference. We are homophobic filiates and such. And therefore we do believe that God has called us to love mankind. In, in saying that this evening, we get, get straight into the, uh, the gay controversy itself. The United Nations has an incredible influence upon the Western world, and especially Western governments. <coughs> Most of the policies of the United Nations is actually supported, strange enough, by the West. A viewpoint that many will agree with me and concur this evening, that the United Nations is considered to be influenced much by Western thought. And isn't it ironic that the West was created and came into existence and established Judeo-Christian values initially, of which it's unshackled itself from. So many of the Judeo-Christian values that the West subscribed to and has made the West a great, great section of uh, mankind, that they've actually gone against that. And the United Nations has put in certain policies and programs and certain commissions in order to find out where humanity is and where humanity should be. And one of the decisions made by the United Nations and a policy embraced and therefore promoted in the West is the fact that with human rights and civil liberties that the gay community should be treated like every single other citizen of the world. And therefore they should have a right to marry who they want to marry. Now we know that we are on quite a slippery slope when we begin to tamper with the prototype that we made reference to earlier. The prototype that is found in God's Word. Because what if a person, what if a person emerges and says, I have fallen in love with my sister. What if someone says, I have fallen in love with my mother? And therefore that love has a sexual connotation to it. How would we interpret that? Could we say that they're wrong? Could we say that it's evil? Could we say that we don't embrace that? On what basis are you going to condemn that if you are not going to consider some other practices and other sexual orientations um, that possibly may be questionable? I put that in to the discussion this evening, gentlemen, because a new normal in the world is emerging. A new normal of tolerance. Now, we believe in tolerance, but tolerance does not mean abdicating your position and your opinion. It means hearing the other person out. And therefore, this evening, um, Kenneth, I'm going to ask you, um, do you believe that there is a world agenda, a mass media agenda, to condition people to accepting um, this as a norm? Most definitely, Bruce. It's, it's interesting to use the word tolerance, because it's, it's amazing how the world is very tolerant toward everyone else except the Christian message. So as soon as a Christian speaks up and just speaks his or her mind, then the world seems to not be very, very tolerant. But so to speak, we see a, a big move in the media, the printing press, and even the television and movies toward a very pro-homosexual uh, mindset. I just list a few things this evening as we can see that this agenda is taking place where there's, there's a real move toward normalizing this mindset that the gay movement and homosexuals is part of normal society. In the, in the sphere of, as you said, the prototype. And I use um, the movie X-Men, for example, is a big move toward that Ian McKellen, who's a very prominent uh, actor in the X-Men, is, is a homosexual man, and he has said that the X-Men script and the whole writing of it is toward desensitizing people toward the gay movement. Also at the Cannes Film Festival this year, the winner was a movie about two uh, lesbians, and there was a five to ten minute explicit sex scene that people said how groundbreaking this truly is, which is concerning. Because if that becomes the norm, to say this is okay, if people are watching things that are sexually explicit and then trying to justify it, it becomes very, very concerning. Also within, not just movies, but also on television, just normal daytime television, we have modern family, where it's presented as as part of the family setup. 
also the fixer. You have those type of mindsets. Even on seven the line, you have this type of, of mindset where girls are having a little a bachelorette and uh, there's a man running around looking pretty similar and part of the whole setup. So that they, sorry, can they know you know this is what seven the line? <laughs> no, I've heard this from someone who's watching. <laughs> Just check that. For sure. No, I don't. I prefer bold and beautiful. <laughs> um, and then also in music, of course, we know Lady Gaga is, is a very avid uh, promoter of, of the gay movement, specifically with the song Born This Way. That's, that's part of the, the mindset. In music, also, there's a new song that's just come out by Macklemore, dealing with uh, I Can't Change the Way I Am. And in that song, by the way, it's very interesting how he misrepresents the scriptures. He says that don't uh, misinterpret a book that was written three and a half thousand years ago. So once again, error is being thrown into that, as you spoke about, Bruce, the extreme right is being used as the norm. So what we are seeing even in art, talking about the word tolerance, in art even there's a great depiction here of, of, of homosexuality, also even of anti-Christian minds within that. So you'll go to an art gallery where everything is seen as art. You actually have a cross that is placed in a vial with urine. And that's art. That to people is art, but yet we can't speak up because they're not intolerant of art. So we see within the media, even the printing press, you will find a lot of adverts when it comes to promoting uh, clothing or promoting fragrances, even promoting anything, there will be a shift toward homosexual relationships. So we're seeing this within the world today, trying to cause a paradigm shift in the minds of people. So there's definitely a worldwide agenda when it comes to the media so. Right, thank you, Ken. It's very well presented and very interesting. I haven't even heard of some of those uh, movies and books that you made reference to. It shows how well read you are, young man. Um, or, if, or, else, or else it shows me as a minister you have a lot more time on your hands. <laughs> However, folks, I'm sure that there are certain gay conditions, there are certain factors. Uh, nobody puts up their hand and says, Look, yeah, I've chosen to be this way. I, I've chosen to be gay. Um, Warren, could you give us some insight into what is often used as a reason why people have this orientation, uh, this propensity, in terms of genetics? Now, we know that before you uh, decided to come into the ministry and study theology, you were going to become a medical doctor. That's what you want to be. That was your vision and your dream as a young man. And uh, after you matriculated from grade high school, you thought, well, that's the direction I'm going to go in. And then the Lord changed your, your direction. So you have a special interest in medical issues and, and uh, genetics. Could you give us some insight and background to you in that regard? Thanks. <coughs> Thanks. Bruce, I'm, I'm glad you clarified that because I was wondering why I always get the biology questions. So now, now that we know um, why, um, please excuse me if this does start sounding like a biology lesson, but we're going to have a look, and I, I want to just, in the minds of everybody here, let me see what the, the big picture is of genetics, and understand the complexity of it, so that when we start speaking about, I was born this way, it's not just words in a song that we quote, and we would like to believe but that we have some background to it, and that we can understand what that genetic makeup really um, entails. So I'm going to ask if we can have displayed on the screen, there is a picture of, um, of our human DNA found in a human cell, and it gives to us the chromosomes, which is the X-looking shape in the middle of the screen there, that's found in the nucleus of every single cell in our body and there are billions of cells within our body. Within every single nucleus, the human being has 22 chromosomes. Each chromosome of those 22 determines our somatic makeup, so our physical makeup, our hair color, our body, um, some of our temperament, personality, all of that is found within 22 of those um, chromosome pairs. There is one pair of chromosomes a 23rd chromosome pair that determines our sex as to whether we're going to be male or female. 
And those are referred to as the XX or the XY chromosomes. So that within our DNA makeup, each chromosome carries with it our DNA, which is the strand that is uncoiled in. Now that picture is a, it's an illustration and it's highly magnified. So what we're looking at here is, from, is, is very, very microscopic. They say that if you had to take um, a strand of DNA from a chromosome and pull it out, it would be about five centimeters long. Now that doesn't sound very long. But if you had to take each of those five centimeters from each cell in our body and put it together, it would be the length of going to the sun and back 70 times. That's how much DNA there is in our body. So when they look at the human genome and our genetic makeup, it's not a simple question. Or rather, it doesn't have a simple answer. So we can't say that within our, within our genetic makeup, oh, we're going to go look at these. There are billions and billions and billions of cells. And within those cells is that DNA makeup. Within that DNA makeup, there are billions and billions of um, possibilities that exist. And to this day, although they've mapped the human genome, scientists still don't know what those chromosomes, what those um, DNA strands are responsible for. It's not a simple question. It's easy if you can have a test environment where you have somebody with blue eyes, and, and that's what we're going to have a look now, the XXXY, how we determine um, whether you're male or female. Um, it's easy to determine what chromosomes are responsible for the gender, because you have test subjects where you can replicate. So, yeah, we have these chromosomes, we have a boy. Yeah, we have these, and it's a girl. And in every single case, it follows the same pattern. So, we don't have girls, except in extreme cases, we're talking one in millions, where you have girls who have XX and then have male um, physique, or the other way around. But let's have a look quickly at this, this diagram. We have I don't know who these people are, but they'll remain anonymous for tonight. So, we have A and B subjects there. We are assuming they're in a, a heterosexual uh, marriage, and they have children. And from the, the female, she carries the XX chromosomes uh, on that 23rd pair. Both of them are X. The male carries one X and one Y chromosome. That Y chromosome is a lot smaller than the X chromosome. So within every single cell of a man's body, we have slightly less DNA. I think that's what makes us foster. <laughs> we carry just that little bit less. Do you agree? It could be, it could be, but we'll leave that to the scientists. The combination of the XX and the XY, if we're looking there, this picture just very basically shows us hair color and eye color. So that you can have a combination, we have um, children at the bottom with different hair colors and different eye colors, and there's a 50-50 ratio. So as, as parents, you have a 50-50 chance of having a boy or a girl. If it were really simple, is there any genetic study that can determine whether people are born as homosexuals? If it was really simple, they would just show you the chromosomes. So he has a man, man's physique, but he has woman's chromosomes. That would be the simple answer, but it's not that simple, because men are men and women are women according to their chromosomes. So now they have to look deeper. And in all of the studies that have been undertaken, they are still divided. So that they do these studies, they have um, test subjects, they have people who are either homosexual or who are heterosexual, um, they follow their lives, they look at their genetic makeup, they have even done genetic research on cadavers, on people that have passed away, to look at physical components of the brain, of all sorts of other aspects of the human physiology, and in all of the studies, it is still inconclusive. So that you will have some who will come up with a study and say, we've done these tests on identical twins, and if the identical twins, if one of them is a homosexual, 50% of the time, the other one is also a homosexual. And that proves then that homosexuality is genetically passed on. And then the question, the immediate question is, what about the other 50%? So in the other 50%, you have one of the identical twins that is a homosexual, but the other one isn't. So it, is it then genetics? Is the other one saying, I was born this way, but I'm fighting it for all my life? What is he 
what is his answer? Because he has no homosexual tendencies, he or she. So in, in the studies, the scientific community is still divided. There are studies that try and prove that it is genetic, but as I've illustrated, it's not a simple answer. And there are then studies on the other hand that prove that it is not. So until the scientific community can come up with concrete evidence and that the scientific community can be in agreement, I think it is terribly deceptive to say that people are born this way. Because it makes people believe that they do not have the ability to change. And when we look at our genetic makeup, we were all born this way. And by, by this way, I mean we are not perfect. This is not how God intended us to be. I think I was supposed to be a lot better looking, maybe slightly taller. But in general, every single one of us has to battle with sin because of our genetic makeup. Our genetic model is flawed. And Ken, I was thinking about the, the art, the big thing about art is people say it's, it's, it's freedom of expression. And within our society, freedom of expression and freedom of choice has led to a lot of evils, to a lot of hurt, to a lot of pain, where people use that freedom of choice to express their own um, freedoms on others. And it's, it's a violation of somebody else's choice. But unfortunately, that freedom has to exist. Because it is that exact freedom that got us to this place where we are now. The freedom of choice that God gave to Adam and Eve. Because God did not intend for our genetic makeup to be like this. Our genetic model is flawed in so many places. And it leads to so many other tendencies that we might have. Homosexuality might be one of those tendencies. Which is a combination of our genetic flawed model. But also of our temperament of our personality and other factors. So that genetically, I could have a tendency to be a homosexual. But I am not forced to follow any tendency that I might have. Because if I, personally, if I had to follow every single tendency that I have had in my life, I would probably be in St. Albans right now. <laughs> if you think about the things that you have thought about doing, but why don't you tell me that before you came and spoke to me about marrying my daughter? <laughs> I was waiting for the 10 year anniversary. <laughs> but I, I'm, hoping, I'm hoping that Bruce will agree with me that that, that is something that everybody feels. <laughs> there are tendencies that we have where we have to deal with them personally. And we have to use that freedom of choice that God has given us. So that we choose what we know God says is right. And that's life. That's what life consists of. Thank you, Warren. Uh, Kenneth, environmental issues. Does the environment of a child impact upon their orientation? Seeing we're dealing with this as a subject, of course, um, the first seven years of a child's life is absolutely crucial. But the environment, the social dynamic, etc., etc., are, are there factors there? Try to, I know that if you're going to take as long as what Warren did, although what he said was good, I know what you're going to say is good as well, but I also want to respect the audience and their time, and I don't want to distract from the main issues we still want to get into. So, uh, Ken, if you can succinctly just present to us the environmental issues. Yes. In one last. <laughs> <laughs> no, definitely. Uh, is there a genetic component? Yes, there is. And specifically, as you mentioned, the temperament. Certain people have certain temperaments. But as science even tells us, and these very scientists who have made all of these studies, environment plays the greatest role and has the greatest influence. When a child grows up, as you said, Bruce, those first seven years, your concept of security, of love, of sexuality, and of childhood is based upon your home. If that home is not stable, and it's, it's, it's interesting, it's in the last, I would say, 50 to 60 years, if you've looked at the family unit, it hasn't been very positive. The family unit is disintegrated. So it's causing a lot of instability in many, many people's lives. The sexual awareness as well in a, in a, in a person's life should only occur at adolescence. But what we see today is happening a lot earlier. People are a lot more aware 
Why? Because of media, because of music. Now you put uh, something on an iPod, someone puts that music on, and speaking about things that children should not be aware of. And people want to be excited about it, it's not exciting at all. Because a child is not actually made or geared up for this sexual awareness, awareness that is happening. So it's happening a lot earlier. In the first 14 years, if there is a sexual encounter or something of a sexual nature that is out of place, it is destructive beyond what words can be made. Out of place in the development. In the development, 100%. Ted Bundy said the problem with rapists and, and murderers of a sexual nature is the fact that they were fascinated by pornography before the age of 12 and exposed to it. That creates a massive problem. And our world today, we're sitting here discussing this, we have to look at our world and the way in which the world is going toward the sexual side, which we are dealing with in this series, is shocking and it is scary. So it's unfortunate that this is what is happening and everyone wants to use exceptions as norms, but many of us have grown up in homes that have not been perfect, that things have been said, things have been done, we've been exposed to things that will have lasting consequences. So environment, according to, to a book, I've got a book here from an objective source on a Christian book at all, it's abnormal psychology, it's a psycho psychological book, um, and it says here what is important for our purposes is that this theory combines biological, uh, psychological, or environment variables and suggests how they interact and form sexual orientation. Right. So there's so many factors with environment, as this book says, as the greatest, greatest um, influence in someone's life. So the first seven years of a child's life is absolutely crucial because it basically sows the seeds for what they can become when they are adults. Very important. In the first three years of a child's life, a child goes through an awareness of phallic development. And this phallic development is something that I think um, many of those who um, have presented the exposition on the subject have drawn attention to. And therefore, what I, what I want to do is explain a little bit quickly about what that phallic development is. What is important here is how many of you can remember um, what your life was, your home environment, uh, who your babysitter was, or what uncle and aunt actually took you for a drive when you were a year old. None of us. The brightest among us would be possibly three or four. I can remember. <laughs> <laughs> I can remember three or four, but beyond that, two, two and a half, um, two years and eleven months, I can't recall. But from three to four, I can. I've got vague vague recollection of, of uh, some incidences that actually took place in my personal life. But in the first three years of child, we, we, we don't remember that. So the child actually goes through a gender identity at that age. Because as you, uh, Laurie, you've got, you've got a little one, um, and you know that there was a time where she didn't know that this was a hand. And then she realized, well, hang on, every time this thing moves past me, I'm going to try to grab it with the other hand, she does. Then she begins to realize, hang on, this hand is actually part of my body. And in exactly the same way, the child begins to discover its genitals. During that particular phase of development, if the child's development is interrupted or interfered with in an inappropriate manner, it could affect the child's predisposition towards that particular uh, um, uh, propensity. And therefore, that cannot be under, underestimated. And therefore, much of the development of, of the child's sexuality, um, their sexual identity and their, sexual, their, their, their uh, gender role can actually be tampered with. And that happens on the male side, can happen on the female side, depending upon what type of misappropriate action or behavior is taking place in that child's mind. Because that becomes entrenched in the human psyche and manifests itself later on. And therefore you say, but ever since I was a little boy, I enjoyed playing with uh, dolls and I enjoyed doing this and I enjoyed doing that. That was a girly thing if I was a boy. Or I did that which was more manly and I, I was more attracted to girls than I was more attracted to girls, but to boys. The, the point is that that could have been entrenched there. Now, that's a theory, a phallic theory, but it is something worse while considering and raising it. Given the exposure, as we, as we have said, yeah. given the exposure, trauma, the fight-flight syndrome with trauma, any trauma has a lasting impact. Yeah. 
Yeah. Now, when a child between the age of one and seven, and maybe a bit older, eight, nine, has a trauma or something that they are exposed to that is out of place, it could also have created a pathway which would be a problem. Okay. Having presented that, we've, we've looked at the gay controversy, the gay condition. Let's have a look at the, the, the gay movement in context to the sacred scriptures. Now, let us say this, that can adulterer go to heaven? Can a pedophile go to heaven? Can an alcoholic go to heaven? Now, somebody might be sitting up there saying, well, please don't throw us in that particular category. Well, all of us are put into that category because all of us are sinners. So, what is the basis? What is the basis of our salvation from a Christian perspective? Not everyone says, I'm a Christian, he's a Christian. You know, you have many people say, well, I'm a Christian, but I've got this particular uh, lifestyle. Well, what makes a Christian? What is the basis of Christianity? Is it something you do? Or something that has already been done for you? Or it's, the scriptures are very clear that the only basis for us being a Christian is accepting the Lord Jesus Christ, that he died for our sins and that he rose again. And when we accept that, God does the work. So not only did God do the work historically on the cross when our sins were forgiven, and when Christ died, the scriptures say that he died to forgive us of our sins, which are future tense. So although all of us are sinners, we all fall into that category. God is in the business of saving sins. That is what he does. So is it, is it a surprise to us that a sinner can be saved? It should never be, because that is the exact definition of salvation. When God does that work, he starts, he gives us life within. And that life within gives us a hunger and a thirst to do what God wants us to do. That can be pushed down, and we can harden our hearts towards God's work. However, the scriptures teach that the fruit is going to be the presentation to the rest of the world as to what has happened in our lives. So that as Christians, we produce fruit that is pleasing to God in our lifestyle. Is it possible that we could not be producing that fruit and still be saved? It is possible. God is the ultimate judge, but we will not be fulfilling the role that God wants us to fulfill if we are suppressing that truth. If we are convicted about a certain area in our lives and we do not do something about it, God is unable to use us effectively until we deal with those issues that are around us. When we look at the Old Testament, and many folks have cited the Old Testament, like Leviticus chapter 20. It gives us a litany of, of, of areas in which the Jewish people, Israel, as an ethnic national entity, they had to eradicate from their society. They had to stone them and put them to death. So many folks say, well, if you're going to say that adultery is wrong based on Leviticus 20, and homosexuality is wrong based on um, Leviticus 20:13. Then, um, then we should also put these people to death. Now, if you say that in the Bible, or what the Bible says is right, why don't we put them to death? The reason why is that the Old Testament is dealing with an ethnic group, the nation of Israel, an exclusive entity where God had a special plan for them. And that's the reason why he had to protect them as a nation. And therefore, when they entered into uh, alien land, foreign land, they had to eradicate and clean that land out so that they could not and would not take on the practices of those nations that they had uh, conquered. And it's for that reason that even in their midst, Jewish people, Israelites, who have committed the sins of foreigners and those foreign nations that they conquered, they should rather be put into quarantine or exterminated. And that's the reason why the Old Testament deals with some harsh penalties so it is not very prudent for those who are trying to argue in favor of homosexuality and uh, the heterosexual sins of adultery and fornication to actually say, yes, but according to the Bible, this should happen. We wouldn't do that today. Why wouldn't we do that today? Because the New Testament has come. The New Covenant has come. Christ Jesus has set us free. Every one of us, no matter what our orientation, no matter what our sin is, we potentially have been set free. We can become Christians not based on what we do, but based on what we believe Christ has done for us. That secures our salvation. 
Our responsibility, how we're going to respond to our salvation in our lifestyle, is between ourselves and God. And therefore, we don't stand in judgment of these people and judge homosexuals or judge adulterers or judge the pedophile. We say that we believe on the basis of God's word that that is not the norm and that is not right and that the word of God opposes it. But we don't stand in judgment in saying that God doesn't love those people because he loves them as much as he loves us. And that God has a destiny for them. And that they need to get on their knees and confess Christ as Savior. And then, then let their personalities and their sinful, old sinful nature, let it become aligned to the new prototype, which is Christ, the second Adam. We lost it all in the first Adam. The second Adam is Christ. It's come to restore what we've lost. And I think on the basis of that, um, the, the New Testament introduces us to some of the sins that is actually mentioned in the Old Testament. But the take is a little different. Ken, would you like to uh, take us through that? I don't want to race through this, although I cannot see the clock. I've been trying to see the clock there, but it's... it's what is it? Okay. Well, time is up, Ken. Unfortunately, we have to go home and have coffee now. But I, I think... Can you give us another ten minutes? <laughs> Okay, well, if, if, if it was in, con in Congress, we would... <laughs> <laughs> Unanimous, you're right. But if it was in Congress, we'd say the nays and the, the yeas and the nays. Okay. I think it's important, uh, Bruce, we can look at uh, Romans chapter 1, which is used so often, but there's some other ones I want to, want to draw attention to. Romans chapter 1, we can, we can discuss it right. basically there in its context, but I just want to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9. Specifically, yeah. That says, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites. Now the context of this passage is very, very important. Paul is listing the characteristics of those who are unbelievers, of those who are pagans. So he's saying Christians should not partake of these practices. It doesn't say that if you, if you have done this, that there's no salvation for you, are not going to see the kingdom of God. That's not the context of the passage. But it's important because many people who will cite this, these passages will then say, uh, well, it's not, the New Testament doesn't deal with homosexuality and the fact that it is wrong, it is sin. And the word that's used there for homosexuals is malakos, it's a Greek word. Um, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the King James, it actually uses the word effeminate. Um, and that's what it deals with there as, as homosexuality. Paul says these are characteristics that are sinful. Then also 1 Timothy chapter 1 verse 10. For fornicators, for sodomites, for kidnappers, for liars, for perjurers, and if there is any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine. Uh, the word there for, for sodomites there is arsenicotus. Um, it's a sodomite. So the Bible uses specific words to make us realize that throughout the New Testament, this means it's Galatians chapter 5 that deals with sexual sin, Revelation chapter 22, uh, Galatians chapter 3, we can list them, where it speaks about sexual sin. Whatever shape or form that is in is wrong and it's an abomination to the Lord and it's not right, it is sin. So we're not offering a magic cure as many have tried to correct the uh, measures. We are basically saying that anyone in the gay community or someone who feels this is their lifestyle, that we ask them to consider this in the light of scripture. And like all of us, we, we heterosexuals or homosexuals, we have to admit that there's only one perfect person who has ever lived, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. And we need to come through him and in light of our relationship with him, what makes a Christian a Christian is if you're in Christ, if you've taken on his identity. So if we do have an identity crisis, the new identity is found in Christ. Um, 2 Corinthians 5.17 uh, concludes with a wonderful statement, and it applies to each and every one of us, and this is what it declares. It's on the screen. Therefore, if anyone be in Christ, he's a new creation or a new creature. All things have passed away. And behold, all things have become new. I guarantee you that if you humbly come before God and ask Him to
to show you the areas in your life that need to change. Nothing is impossible with God. God can work within your heart and life. We say that lovingly because I think the three of us sitting up here and many who are the leaders of our church will never ever speak down or in a disparaging manner when speaking to anyone who does not have the same opinion we might have. But what we're saying tonight is not just based on our personal opinion, it's based on the authority of the good book which we call the Holy Bible. It's separated from all the books of the world and it has to do with the test. In terms of the historic connection, it is not only because of iPods and social networking that this uh, pandemic has spread throughout the world, but we know that even in, in ancient times, uh, Cicero, the uh, Roman statesman, said it was because of the strong feminism in Greece, in Greece that the, the Greek men turned to young boys and homosexuality became rife in Greek culture. Um, and I believe that the strong spirit of feminism, which we know is the result of uh, chauvinism and the way men have actually treated women, um, the strong movement of feminism has also given rise to uh, men having difficulty in understanding their identity and their gender role. Tonight, friends, we certainly have not exhausted the subject. There is so much more that can be said on this, but we hope that what has been covered has been helpful and has given you some insight into A, our position, the, the Christian uh, objective view, and also the fact that for God so loved the world that you and me and all of us that he gave his son, knowing Christ changes your destiny completely, and therefore we trust that you will find peace and comfort in bowing your knee and acknowledging him as the King and Lord of your personal life. Thank you very much for joining us tonight. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for this opportunity. We know that we've looked at a variety of different um, issues, a plethora of, of different uh, matters. And Lord, as we leave tonight, we realize there will be a lot of questions still racing through our minds. And we pray that you will help us as believers and as Christians to reach out with compassion. I pray these blessings in the precious name of our Savior. Amen. Thank you. Thank you for listening.